this is not my usual suit I wear at the job. I figured I would uh, try to put on the Ritz a little bit. So let's start off with Condé Nast. Who, what, where, how, and why? If it sounds like a French name, it is. Condé Nast, he was an, a person who led an incredible life. And Condé Nast is a company, an incredible company with a life of its own. It's continued. And I'm just giving you here a little sampling of some of the magazines. We'll touch on them uh, as we go through this presentation a little bit. Uh, anytime you go through a magazine store or an airport and you look at the various selections that are there, it's a good chance that anywhere between one quarter to word, one third of those publications are by Condé Nast. That's how big they are. I'm going to show you now this photo again. This photo uh, erroneously states that Stanford, Connecticut <laughs> is the address, as you can see up there. Okay? Uh, they probably sent this out to be printed, and there's a good possibility that the borders were a little fluid between Stanford and Greenwich. As you can see, the fountain, this is in the heyday approximately, I'd say about in the 30s. The castle tower is still there, as it is now, and the fountain is still there. Now that building may look a little bit like the Hyatt Regency Greenwich, but that building was torn down and the hotel was put up in its place. Okay, one of the, my interests in here was to get a preservation project to get our wonderful Conan as obelisk fixed up. And I'll go into that a little later, but just starting from the top, uh, we have Vogue, Vanity Fair carved in, Underneath that is House and Garden, and underneath that is Condé Nast Press. And we'll talk about that a little further. Now, I'm just going to get a little byline here. They started with one magazine, Vogue, in 1909. 116 years later, it's one of the largest publishing conglomerates in the world. And the parent company is now Advanced Communications. But to the public, Condé Nast is the gold standard in visual and literary content to the entire world. Today they publish 143 titles. Their digital publications were in 30 markets. Their worldwide readership is 263 million people. And they have rich traditions that they've upheld in the printing and the quality of their writing high standards of ethics as well as the quality of their publications. And there's passion, commitment, and responsibility to make sure their stories are interesting to the public and have relevance and are accurate. <clears throat> and then the last thing is they're also loyal to their creative talent as well as their readers. Many, many folks have come through the doors. Various writers, I'm not going into all of their names, but Dor Dorothy Parker, is one of the most famous ones. Uh, but they had various uh, artists whose work was published in their magazines, uh, short stories, uh, serials, people like Ernest Hemingway uh, would publish their work in serial form in some of their magazines. Now, we go to the man, Condé Montrose Nass, born in 1873, died in 1942. You can see him in his uh, very natty, I think that's a seersucker suit. And that's a very uh, fashionable hat he has on his side of his head there. And he was born in St. Louis to William F. Nast and Esther Benoit. My French is horrible. I grew up in the Bronx and I worked so hard to get rid of that nasal wine that they said, uh, French, you have to have the nasal lesson. No, 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 I took too long to get rid of it. And he was named after his French uncle, Condé Benoit. He attended Georgetown University and met a gentleman by the name of Robert Collier, Jr. He received his master's degree from Georgetown and his law degree from Washington University in 1897. He ended up working for Collier's Weekly as their business manager. Then he ended up increasing his circulation through innovative marketing techniques. He had his finger on the pulse of some ideas that we'll see a little later that are very prevalent today. He was way ahead of his time. Okay, he purchased Vogue, as I mentioned earlier, in 1909. Again, you can see extremely well-dressed, 
looking very serious. Uh, a lot of the different folks that worked with him, and especially the writers and artists, had a lot of fun, but he was a very serious person, and he was constantly watching the bottom line. He figured out that elegance, luxury, and appreciation of the finer things in life is really what people wanted. Even if their salaries and their living conditions were not so great, and as America is an upwardly mobile society, if you want to aspire to greater things, he felt that you could be, through Vogue magazine and various other publications, you could be like a fly on the wall. You could be that invisible member watching them go to their various uh, balls or traveling on their yachts. And his writers, and he was able to, through someone we will see in a moment, uh, was able to entree into that, that world. Now, I'm putting this here because this is, again, he was ahead of his time. This word, tastemaker, a person whose judgments about what is good, fashionable, etc., are accepted and followed by many people. Now, this was out of the Merriam-Webster website. It's a dictionary. And, and they claim the first known use was in 1954. So think about that. He started Vogue in 1909, when that word tastemaker was not even invented, was not even in use. But I believe this is what he was, and the various people who worked for him incorporated that. Now this is Edna Woolman Chase, born in 1877, died in 1957. And she was the editor-in-chief of Vogue from 1914 to 1952. That's a pretty long time in magazine terminology. She was the editor for 38 years. And she was the, how should we say, the critical eyes and ears which had to always decide what needed to be cut out, what needed to be trimmed, what people really, really wanted to see. And this is a photo of her at work. Uh, the, just so you know, the editorial and advertising offices were in New York City. They were not here. But all the other businesses involved with Condé Nast were here. Now we have Frank Cronenshield, who was a gentleman in 1872, was born, lived until 1947. Very important gentleman here. He was born in France, so now we have, that, again, that French connection with Condé Nast. His father is a United States citizen, Frederick. He was the director of the American Academy in Rome. That was a very interesting place where different folks from America who wanted to learn the classic arts, about architecture, learn about painting, learn about the various culture uh, of Rome, which was the largest empire the world has ever known. Uh, so that was part of his training and his background. And he was hired as the editor of Vanity Fair one of the other most iconic magazines in 1914. If that year sounds familiar, it's because that was the year that the First World War was started. And I just wanted to show this. Uh, Frank Cronenshield was the one who took Condé Nast by the hand and introduced him to a lot of the writers and the artists all over America and whenever they travel around the world. And so this was a sculpture done by a very famous artist, Alexander Calder. He's more famous for the mobiles. He pioneered the mobile, so when you see something hanging, it looks like a series of coat hangers wing with various different colors. It was a rather individual idea. I'm sure a lot of people told him it would never fly, but it did. And here we have the three main characters, Frank Cronenshield on the left, Condé Nast in the middle, and Edward Woolman Chase conferring, making their decisions. They got lots of photos and different articles on the desk. And they were the real quality control behind this organization. And the reason that it got off to a good start and continues to this day. Now we have a photograph. This is a color photograph from the Greenwich Historical Society where I started maybe about two weeks after I was working here. I saw the pillars out front and I say, what are those, what is that? I you know, didn't know anything about those areas and asked around the hotel and people had bits and pieces. So when I went to the Greenwich Historical Society, they were so nice to uh, share some of their photos and that passion has grown since then. Now, I have outlined in those red circles there the, the obelisk that I'm interested in getting restored so you can get a feel for it. That's East Putnam Avenue, which was used to be called the Boston Post Road that ran all the way from Boston, I think, down to New York City for many, many years in the days of stagecoaches, actually. And you can see on the right-hand side the footprint of the Condé Nast facilities. Okay, this is a further view. This is in 1950, in the 50s. Uh, 
Down here in, the, in that little corner there, you can see a little bit of I-95, which was in the 50s. That was part of uh, President Eisenhower's mission to link up the country with high-speed rails and high-speed uh, highways. So the transportation aspects of the United States would be extremely enhanced, and especially in time of war, remember he was a general during World War II, could be mobilized quickly. This is another picture, of the, a little bit of a close-up. And this shows you a little more of the layout, how you have that beautiful circle divided in two by the road. And there were various gardens on the other side of the street here, which I'll be showing you some pictures of. He also thought that people in beautiful surroundings will work better, will have you know, more conditions conducive uh, to their well-being. It shows that the owner cares about them. Now this slew of buildings over here, I'm told, were actually living quarters for about 50 of their managers who would live here Monday through Friday and go home on weekends because this facility was so uh, high quality and the word got around amongst all the different printers and publishers. So Condé Nast started taking on work for other magazines so that they could achieve similar results. And it was, and it was very successful and of course continued to make Condé Nast a lot of money. Okay, now we're going to the, the different layout. Um, Arbor Press was what Condé Nast purchased when he came here in 1921. Saw the site and said, you know, this, this is a little small press, but it, there's something in this property that's intriguing to me. I think I'm going to buy it and expand it. So there's 22 acres on the east side, in which we are now, where the hotel is. 11 acres were on the other side. Total of 33 acres. And it was designed by landscape architects Guy Lowell and Ferruccio Vitali. Am I saying that right, Dennis? Yeah. Vitali? Okay. <laughs> I think we have some of those. He imported 60 elm trees and sculptures directly from Italy, which we'll see pictures of. Unfortunately, we don't have close-ups of the statues, but we do have their names. And all the wires were buried underground. You know, we had a storm maybe two or three years ago here in Greenwich that knocked down tons of trees. It came, I think, in late October. A lot of leaves were still on the trees. We had so many people with power outages in Greenwich. But our hotel stayed up. Now, we did have a generator. There were a couple of little blips here and there. But by and large, I think we had probably one quarter of Greenwich stay in our hotel room. Uh, here, get our Wi-Fi and stationed out there. OK, now I'll just go into this with the uh, obelisk here. Discussions I had in mid 2015 between myself and the Greenwich Historical Society. We want to form community initiative to restore these pillars. You know, I think Greenwich is one of those communities where lots of people pull together and get involved in different projects of one sort or another, very successful, raise a lot of money for hospitals, community causes, schools, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought that this should be a part of the picture. You can see where the different rusts from that copper top roof have just fallen on the lettering and kind of in dis disarray. To me, this was the, uh, the showstopper for me. Recent graffiti on this iconic Condé Nast Towers, I say at the bottom there, screaming, save me, save me. You know, they have a thing in gang, gangs where this is called a tag, when someone marks a building, uh, that usually they're claim, staking it out as their territory. And for what I understand, uh, one of the, uh, the bus stop that's out front was also had some graffiti, but that's since been cleaned off. So I think with the, now is the time to act if we're going to do something. Uh, to get these things restored. This is a little bit of a close-up where you can see some of the cracks and some of the rust and some of the mold that's starting to come in there. Uh, and, you know, and sometimes it's going to be an eyesore. And these things were built, I mean, they are solid. This is probably some type of a granite that's around it. But they were hollow. And in closer examination and taking pictures over a number of years, you know, because I'm here at the hotel, it would be five years in February. So I've been, you know, watching and observing, and I discovered that there were still light bulbs up here in the copper uh, roof. Well, it looks like my pointers can't get out of all battery. But anyway, if you look under, you'll see those lights. Those are bulbs that are still there. And so these uh, obelisks here are hollow inside. And there's even a, a metal panel at the back of them where someone could go up and insert themselves inside and do the various wiring. So if this were cleaned up, also I'll point out one thing with glamour. If you notice the glamour section over here, it looks a little bit different off color than this, doesn't it? You see here with the square? So my theory, and I can't confirm it's positive, is that on the other sides, Vanity Fair is there. 
And Vanity Fair went out of business in 1936. Uh, apparently, the Frank, Mr. Frank, Frank uh, Cronenshield, who was there before, he was so much into doing artist paintings and stories.